coming up on this episode of Up for Debate, we are using our noggins to come up with some un-inventions. That's right, we're going to discuss things we wish had never been invented and what the world would have been like without them. We may even slip in some things we wish had been invented. It's going to be a real creative, wacky episode of Up for Debate. We hope you stick around because it's going to start for you right now. This is Up for Debate, episode number 53, recorded June 2nd, 2016, The Uninventors. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Up for Debate, uh, the show that um, will absolutely win a Nobel Prize for this. I'm Sean Jennings, joined, as always, um, by the man, uh, Matt Mariani. Yeah, there's always, uh, I have this theory that, you know, they say that great inventors aren't really appreciated in their time, and I, I'm pretty sure that that's going to be true someday for us, Sean. I think that this this podcast is so far ahead of its time that it may take a little while for uh, you know sometimes. for those of us out there to realize how awesome we are. You know, sometimes I think about that where you know these you know you think back a thousand years ago, we only have a very small amount of the documents that existed at that time, right? What has survived the sands of time? Who's to say that was the good stuff or the popular stuff? That's true. That's you know? so true. I mean, to be, a thousand years from now, the only relic of this time that could exist could be this show. Yeah. And people, I, I, people I, will sort of, like, the Bible is held up to be the ultimate book. I mean, we could be held up because there's no other option to understand this time. Yeah. Well, what if there was a book that was, like, ten times better that came out around the same time, but it was destroyed in a flood or something? Exactly. We've never... We're buried under a bunch of sand and rocks. Exactly. Exactly. That's so, why we have people like Indiana Jones out there to exactly. go and Mr. Find Jones, Mr. Jones. They're the real heroes. Yeah, yeah. archaeologists. Archaeologists. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. This podcast brought to you by the American Society for Archaeology. Yes. Yes, they did not pay us to say anything nice about them, but it is brought by them. Um all right, Matt. Before we get to the topic at hand i want to just quickly remind everyone i did not get a chance to update them today so they're a couple days old but our 2016 summer movie league is still going strong um we had some big movies come out this week so i'll remind everybody that they can get updates all summer long at upfordebate.tv slash draft uh you can go there and get um the live updates as we go through to see how we're doing um matt would you like to hear the standings Right now. I would like to hear them right now. Yeah, see, people are going to think their their podcast app stopped working. <laughs> so um, in fifth place, with $47 million off of one movie, Mike. In fourth place, making a bit more off of Neighbors 2, Colby with $62 million. Uh, Matt, picking up some of that sweet Angry Birds cash. Uh, $204 million in third place. In second place, with $388 million, nearly all of it from Captain America, Dan in second. And returning to first place glory after a brief reprieve with $464 million. Me. So I have a theory here. Okay. I think you just wanted to share the standings of the movies so you can tell everyone that you're now in first once again. So, two things. Was one, that theory be correct? No. Well, one, last update, we share it every you week. Were in we share it every week. So, you can't. But two, yes, you're right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I made sure to point that out to Dan as well. Because he was all excited to be in first. And then it did not last. No. Nope. Um, yeah. So, uh, I know. I think my next big release is going to be Warcraft. Is Warcraft. Yeah. For that. Yeah. We got, um, not this weekend, but next weekend. This coming weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let's recap. Last weekend, we had two supposedly big movies, and they didn't pan out quite so well. Alice Through the Looking Glass and X-Men Apocalypse. Alice Through the Looking Glass completely collapsed, um, grossing just $36 million over the weekend. And X-Men Apocalypse did okay with $86 million. Um, All right. A fun fact, you know, one of the reasons Alice collapsed, in case you're curious, when the original, uh, the first one came out, 82% of the ticket sales for that film were uh, 3D or IMAX. Oh. The sequel, 52% were 3D or IMAX. So even if the same number of people saw it, the box office gross is going to be less because they didn't get the premium for the 3D or IMAX. 
See. Okay. Well, that's that's a see. That's the the deep kind of like uh, saber metrics that you really have to go over with a fine tooth comb if you're going to be a pro at uh, well, picking movies. The problem is for... I didn't realize it before I picked the movie. That's the problem. I know that now. It did not help me. That's a month like ago. Some real deep cut. That's like that's like in baseball when you got like the managers who play like lefty righty matchups mm -hmm. and who go like who go and, and pour over the really deep statistics. That's like, Those are my yeah, you really have to have that kind of mind for it. Well, hopefully Looking that mind like will... Things like, well, you know, 55% uh, of, of, of 18 to 24-year-olds like to eat popcorn with this movie. That means that if they're going to eat popcorn, they're going to get thirsty, they're going to leave halfway through it, and they might demand their money back while they're in the lobby because they have something better to do. I'm sure if you were really bored and were really good at programming, you could probably put some algorithms together to pretty accurately project based on demographics and past films and ticket prices. And you could probably do some analytics around that. I am not going to yeah. do that. Um, I will win without them. Um, if I didn't have a job, maybe. <laughs> if I were smart. <laughs> um, so this coming weekend we have um, – Two movies, one from Colby, Pop Star, Never Stop, Never Stopping, starring The Lonely Island, and... Uh, well, that actually looks pretty good. It does. I would absolutely be willing to see it, and the reviews have been generally positive. I had never heard of it before the movie draft, but then I started watching some trailers, and actually looks looks kind of funny. Yeah, I think so, and I like those The Lonely Island guys, so I think that should be fun. We also have uh, my movie... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 Out of the Shadows coming out this weekend as well. And is that it weird that I'm kind of excited? I kind of want to see it. Um I mean if you were a, if you were a Ninja Turtles kid and you're you're like longing for some nostalgia, I'll give it to you. See, like this is how then I, can, and then I get it. I totally get it. It's like the people who are excited for a new Space Jam. Oh yeah. Well, you know, Matt, I'll tell you this is how weird I am, is not only was I not a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles kid, I watched the first movie and did not like it, and I'm still excited to see the second one. So Okay. I think Michael Bay's just really good at cutting trailers. I well, think that's the problem. I don't know if I should talk. I'm I'm pretty excited to see the World of Warcraft <laughs> movie. And I've never hey, I've I'm never with you. Warcraft, so I'm with you. That looks I think we good. just long for that escapism. Yeah, I think Warcraft's going to be an interesting movie, uh, especially because there are three big movies coming out that weekend. Now you see me too, The Conjuring 2 and Warcraft. Um, plus uh, X-Men Apocalypse and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will both still be in theaters at that point. Um, we may be hitting saturation, so. That's the key. The key, I don't think the, I don't think the sequel, because see, those are sequels, and I'm not sure if they're going to draw that much of an audience away from Warcraft, but the key being that you still have Captain America, and you still have um, the other movie you said that I immediately forgot. X Men. It's all, still in theaters. X Men. Yes, they're still they're still there. So, um, that's I think that could be a potential draw away from Warcraft. I agree, but we'll have to stay tuned and find out. Of course, up for hopefully the neckbeards that are going out to see Warcraft have already seen X Men. Exactly. That Heavy moviegoers. Something else. Yeah. yeah. We haven't had a lot of big grosses. I mean, you had 74 to date for Angry Birds, which um, it will probably hit 100 by the end of the summer, but I thought it would have done better. So yeah. it's not been a particularly big... I mean, Money Monster only did 35. Neighbors 2 only did 42. I mean, it's not been a particularly big summer. So we will see. You'll have to stick around and tune in next time to find out more. But... We've got to continue on because we've got to get to the topic to the show at hand, and I want to give credit to Up for Debate super fan who's never listened to an episode, Dan Miller, um, who would like uh, who pitched the topic we will be doing this evening, and that topic is uninventions. Matt, society today in the 21st century is an amazing place. Is it? Well, that's what we're going to find out because <laughs> the idea is if you could uninvent something, okay. What would you uninvent? Now, first of all, we've got to decide how we're going to interpret an uninvention. Yes. So, an uninvention would, to me, when I was researching this topic, what I had in my head was 
an uninvention. So you take something that's already been invented and you imagine a world in which this invention has never existed, in which this was this invention was never made. And then you think about the consequences of that world, what that world looks like without it. Mm-hmm. Um, what that world is uh, is lacking or is better off for without it. To me, that's what an non-invention is. Yeah, I kind of imagined it as, you know, the theory of, a, of an infinite number of universes, and I just imagine that there was one universe where everything is basically the same except the one thing we uninvent isn't there. So an alternate version of our reality where that thing does not exist and has never existed. So I think that's fair. Now, do you, mm-hmm. do you, I know you've got a couple, I've got a couple. Who wants to go first? I'll jump right in. Oh, please do. Okay. So the first thing that I thought of was the most broad strokes invention that you could possibly think of the wheel. And I said, what happens if there's no wheel? If you take the wheel away? Now that led to an insane scenario where rather than that well, I'll I'll just I'll it's, it would take too long to explain, so I'll just summarize it. Rather than having things based on concentric circles, you have an entire world where where like kind of mashing together rectangles and triangles and trying to get them to roll. And I think eventually that, that kind of just becomes a world where wheels eventually get invented. I think it's, it's too impossible to imagine where a world where there isn't a wheel. Like also, I think you have the option of maybe turning things into sleds and pulling them around with like, without wheels where they're just like flat planes and stuff. Uh, but that gets really complicated. It leads to a world where there's a lot more slopes and inclines, which is kind of interesting to imagine. Um, so then I said wheels, 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 steering wheels, and that's the invention I went with, a world in which steering wheels were not invent- invented. I'm just being brutally honest. This is, this was my thought process. No, I appreciate the, the stream so, uh, of consciousness here. <laughs> steering wheels, a world where there is no steering wheels. Now, let me ask, because when I approach this topic, I... The things I picked to uninvent were things I dislike and things I I wish had been not invented. Okay, see, I didn't take you that did, approach. You at all. just picked something. I picked something in the world. You went a little more and philosophical. Imagine a world it. without it. Wow, and imag- okay, imagine a world without steering wheels. Because I think if I want if I wanted to choose something that I didn't like and wanted to see uninvented, I would probably choose cancer. <laughs> no, right? my idea seems so petty. <laughs> <laughs> You're like hunger. I wish, I wish I we would, could uninvent hunger. hunger. Oh no! I, would, yeah, you know. I feel like such a dick. <laughs> oh my! God. What's yours, Tivo, Sean? Uh, we'll get to mine. Um, yeah. But um, but all right. No, no, no. I listen. A world without st- well, the problem is, is the wheel really the optimum steering device because me- there are many things you don't steer with a wheel like helicopters have joysticks and uh planes have uh, handles and um you know th- there's a number of different ways things can be steered all right so yeah maybe maybe then we're gonna say cars steal steering wheels and cars the car is a stealing wheel steering wheel well um <laughs> and just imagine what cars would be like without steering wheels now, I came up with an interesting um, kind of timeline where there's no steering wheels. Now, I think in the very early, correct me if I'm wrong, but the very, very earliest modules of cars had steering wheels, but they also were, were very much gear oriented and they relied on levers mm-hmm. and gear shifting in addition to, to, a, to like a guiding steering wheel. Uh, so I, like I, at first I thought maybe they, they still stick with that, those gear shifts and those levers, but they throw in a couple of pulleys Mm -hmm. and, uh, all of a sudden you can also steer with an additional like pulley that's kind of wrapped around a top of a, of a, of a lever. So you grab the top of the pulley and you can kind of like, like move it around and that moves the car around. 
the, what, what is this chitty chitty bang bang what, what the, you know i mean what what sort of wacky whimsical uh, dr seuss mobile are you building here it's pretty wild. it's pretty out there man but I, i'm just trying to think of the time that the car was invented this sure. is the kind of thing that i think an inventor would have devised to replace the steering wheel so i've got a crazy thought now wait yes. uh, before you get oh, your you crazy know, I thought you i going. might i might address it because i had a whole timeline of of the evolution of this steering process so hear me out you have these pulleys one on the right side one on the left side that are at the top of your roof of your car okay now i know the purists out there are going to say well what well, matt a lot of early cars didn't have roofs because they didn't really see the point of having a like a like a covered top until uh, a little bit later in their design, and, and that's that's fine. Um, in that case, you would have pedals on the floor, and you would control the direction of the car. You would kind of just hit one pedal, and the car would continue in that direction, and they would be like kind of like a D pad, like a directional pad on a controller. And the car would just proceed in that direction until you hit another lever with your left foot that told it to stop. And then it would keep going in the new direction. Um, but once the roof and the covering of the cars were designed, you could have a, like a pulley on the right side that would turn right, a pulley on the left side that would turn left. And I actually thought this would be kind of cool like if they had something like that in existence today. But as cars evolved, you see, I think that the invention of the analog steering wheel would be um kind of the replacement like nowadays you would have cars that drove based on um kind of like a direct a big directional pad mm -hmm. in place of the steering wheel and you would put your entire hand on the direction you were trying to go like front like you know like straight left right and uh I guess reverse would be the other one. And that was cool because you're trying to picture this in your head. Yeah, no, I'm I'm enjoying story time. This is great. And that that's cool in a way because it also removes the reverse option from the gear shift cuz you can hold this bottom on the directional pad and you would just go back the other way. So that would be my my image of my world without steering but would you have to hold the the forward to go forward yes well that doesn't seem very comfortable you wouldn't if well the, the earlier all right i'll correct what i just said the earlier designs you would have to hold it down but as technology progressed like like today i think they would get to the point where they would have devised a way where you wouldn't have to hold it anymore you would just have to touch it or tap it and it would just keep going in that direction similar to the foot pedal thing that i described earlier but up and in place of the steering wheel i think it's an interesting concept because it's a lot more um tactile than a steering wheel because a steering wheel traditionally you just kind of put your hands on and you turn it but you don't get a lot of feedback and i feel like using a pad like that, you're a lot more involved um, with a lot more movement. So it's it is a very interesting concept. I also I think another yeah. Go ahead. Another drawback of that system, without you know, if you don't use a wheel, is that you're not turning the tires a full 360 degrees. They're kind of just they're turning at like 90 degree angles instead. So you can really only go. Four directions in a in a ninety degree way. So like um, so like for example, with a car right now, picture like a circle. Mm -hmm. You can go from the middle point of the circle. You can go diagonally. You can go like slightly less diagonally. You can go straight. Sure. In like a whole bunch of different ways, but in this design, you can kind of only go left, up, down, and right. So that limits you a little bit. Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. I think that's interesting. I mean, my my first thought when you said remove the wheel was um, do it very... Um, I like the idea of the handles. I kind of see them, you know, when you sit in a car and you kind of put your arms down, like armrest-ish. 
and having controls heli- kind of like a helicopter um, at the end of the armrests as joysticks that you can kind of control in an early model car that would be the strings and the pulleys, right? Yeah. And then in future cars, it would be, uh, you know, digital or, or, or whatever, um, less mechanical. Um, and you, so, you know, push the joysticks forward to go, and then you turn them a little bit one way or the other to steer the car. And um, But then I thought, what if the, the guy who invented the steering wheel, I don't know, steering J wheel, whatever his name was, um, what if after thinking and thinking and thinking, he thought of the wheel and said, no, that's a stupid idea. What if he never came up with a way to steer the car? What if he, he never came up with he, a way to? He never came up with an idea of how to steer the car. So, okay, he decided to adopt the transportation method most popular at the time: rail travel. You ever oh. go to a an amusement park and they have the rides for kids where it's the cars, but they're on the like the track. Yeah, and so you can't really steer them. Interesting. Yeah. So we kind of get like a self-driving car. Well, kind of. Before we get a a um, like a us driving car. Right. So the car is locked into a track. All of our roads are built around these tracks, and it's much more efficient because you know cars are never going to hit each. Well, maybe going front to back, but never side to side because they're, they're never going to go outside their track. I don't know how at. I know today how they would solve, you know, how do you how do you get your track to switch off to, you know, to go to an off ramp kind of, you know, how all those interchanges would work. It barely works on a rail system. Um, so that is, I think, where the trouble would come in. But I think it is an interesting concept that trains were safe at that time because they stayed on the track. So it's possible someone would think, let's create a essentially a small personal train that anyone can own and use and create a system of these um these these mini rail cars these these personal cars hmm okay yeah i like your idea a lot better well it's just you know that that's the thing when when you imagine a world where something's uninvented i kind of like to go to the extreme of you know they wouldn't use a different version what if they didn't have it at all yeah you know and then what I'm what's sure the, what's plan b to, they'd have Backup, yeah. Because the car has like to, this, to this, go with... uh, this roller coaster car future that you've designed. <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. That is an <laughs> extremely good way to put it. Um, and then to control the speed of your car, you could have like one of those um, like spinning teacup discs. Like, you know, the ones that you have in the spinning yeah, teacup. And you just it, yeah. faster you turn it, the faster your car goes. And you spin around and you get really sick. Yeah, that's. That's terrible. But then I think somebody probably would come up with the idea of let's put that spinning wheel like horizontally and then we'll just steal and then you have some steering. the car. <laughs> this is how we how can funny would that be? After, you know, 200 years later after inventing the track car, someone accidentally invents the steering wheel. Why don't we just do this in the first place? It's like the bicycle with the big wheel in the front and the tiny wheel in the yeah. back. It's like, why didn't you just try two regular wheels first? <laughs> um. Very good. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad we got to the bottom of that one. Um, so steering, wheels, yes, steering wheels. Ch- Let's go with uh, what's an invention of yours. So, again, I wanted to pick something I thought the world might be better off without. Um, and no, it is not Hitler or cancer or you know uh, any global warming. Anything noble? No, I imagine a world without a stock market. And the reason I say that is because the stock market sucks. <laughs> it is it is a nonsense system run by a very small group of people that trade essentially worthless things to make pennies per transaction. Our entire global economy rests on it. I imagine a world, an alternate world, where you can still buy stock in a company, but you permanently own that stock in the company unless the company buys it back from you. You cannot trade it to another person. Okay. I think, A, this is a win because you are incentivized to support, you know, today people don't own stocks because they like the company. They own the stock because the stock is going to go up or down. Right? It's not about the company. Nobody, I know people who trade stocks and they don't even know what companies do. They just know it's going to go up or down. 
Yeah. I would rather people invest money in companies they believe will succeed. I think that that would help. Okay. Then, without the stock market, I believe we would have a much more stable economy and a much more flat economic structure in our country. I'm essentially pinning all our troubles on Wall Street, which I know sounds cheesy um, and bernie <laughs> but I, I am telling you, I think it would be an interesting concept. When you talk about an alternate history, you know, the stock market partially responsible for, for many booms and many busts. I mean, I think we could have a, a very radical radical history. This There really wasn't much of a stock market. Um, well, I, I, you know, I don't know, Matt. What do you think the world would be like without a without a stock market? So I'm thinking now about the world right before the stock market, which was a world like kind of how you described, where people invested in companies, joint stock companies that they believed in and that they, they wanted to um, contribute to because they believed in the mission of the company. Earliest examples, the uh, East India Tea Company, um, and uh, that's the earliest one I could think of. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that company went on and, you know, basically discovered the new world and, or, or many, many parts of it um, and helped people to settle there. So, yeah, I, I think the problem is, though, when you have... When you started having people trade stock options and things like that, that's when you you have a market that goes from being made of pure investments into like a, almost a, a, a meta market in itself mm-hmm. where people are trading these investments that they have. And that's where you got the stock market. Um, I think that I think that your your intentions are definitely pure, even though you're not, you know, killing Hitler or ending cancer. Right, right. You're also you're you're saying that the um, uh, the the economy would, would be much less volatile. Sure. Without a um, without a stock market, and mm-hmm. I think I think that's partially true. I think that I'm not sure what I would be afraid of though. Taking away the stock market might kind of impact our um thinking about our technology edge yep our tech edge that we have over many countries or that we've had for many years um because the uh those those large-scale investments um i think they've only increased uh, like as as they're traded um but I, I think more people would probably like to invest in companies that they believe in instead of, you know, just investing for the sake of trying to make money. Um, and I think that's a very Keynesian thing to believe in. I would agree. Uh, you know, I really, uh, for me, I really think it comes down to: Would you prefer a slower growing stable economy or a faster growing volatile economy? We really have right. the latter. I, I think that's exactly. I don't think we would have come as far as we have if it weren't for the stock market. Frankly, it allowed a lot of companies to get money when they needed it. Um, that a a slower, you know, if you had to go out and convince somebody to permanently own your stock, that's a much harder ask. And I think very very few companies would have gotten that. And without mm-hmm. that money, they would have. I'm not saying they wouldn't have grown, but they would have grown far slower. Um, you know, companies really. It's really allowed a lot of explosive growth. The problem is it also has given explosive busts. And, you know, we, we've seen that time and time again. We, we are in a boom and bust economy. And I think part of that is the stock market. So it, I think it's an interesting debate. Um, but I, I just something about this idea of individuals putting their money into a company and just living off the dividends from that stock. I mean, at no point are you really going to you you can't really sell it for a profit. Um, really, you're just getting your your piece of the company back, and I don't know. There's just something really nice about that. So, by the way, I, I will say, if you think that was a a petty thing to uninvent, 
wait till you hear my next one. But <laughs> with that tease, Matt, do you have another thing you would like to remove from existence? And don't say your co-host. That would not be very nice. Mm, how could I remove you, Sean? You are the show. You are oh, the show. I Otherwise, it would just be me rambling about steering wheels for an to hour. To be fair, I would watch that. You would probably be the only one. Um, <laughs> That's more viewers than this show gets. So. <laughs> um, you know what? All right, I'll go. I'll go first. But I kind of want to make this one a brief one because I'm I'm really excited. Truth be told, to to hear your next one because that tease that tease really okay. hurt. Um, I uh, I pencils. Pencils. Uh, pencils. Let's remove the pencil. See what happens without Sharpie? a pencil. Sharpie? Sharpie. No. Okay. Pencil. All right. I'm going to take it to the next level. Not just pencils. Because otherwise, our, our viewers at home are going to say, well, that's the first thing he saw. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what he decided on. No, I actually thought of this. I, I actually planned this I out. You. The pencil and all other cylindrical forms of writing implements. Oh, so cylindrical it, writing implements. So if I understand right? this correctly, so the, the the person inventing the first tools that you use to write, yeah, that are shaped in an elongated way. Sure. That goes that goes for quill pens. So I guess they're not just cylinders. It's quill. It goes for quill pens. It goes for ballpoint pens. It goes for uh, rock and chisel, because that was, you know, it's still, that's still like a, an elongated writing thing. Now, this isn't really for any particular reason mm -hmm. other than to just imagine what the world would be like without them and what we could come up with instead. Hmm. What could we come up with instead, Sean? Well, you know, my first thought, Matt, is that, you know, the human body has a pretty great cylinder already built into it. No, oh, get your mind talk out about of the gutter. No, stop that. No, your <laughs> it's finger. It's not that kind of show, Sean. Your finger, Matt. I think somebody... Yeah, and that's for the premium viewers. Yeah, All right, so yes. Got to pay by the minute for that. No, I think someone would have... Been... Actually, I'm surprised we don't have it now. A, a good way to attach some sort of ink dispensing instrument to the tip of your finger. And you could just... I mean, we do it on a touch screen, so there's no reason why you couldn't do it on a piece of paper. Well, yeah, nowadays, like in today, but think about like prehistoric times. Well, not prehistoric because there so, was no writing. No, but I could see uh, it's think like about a leather, early civilization kind. A leather with a small piece of metal that you dip in ink quill style, and it just attaches to your finger. I mean, you could do that. I don't think it would be that. The problem is, I think you really. I think we would have had to have been really trained to do such a thing. Yeah. Um, and there, I think there would be a little lack of, you wouldn't have as much finesse, as much control. Oh my God, maybe it would change how language is written. Yes. Wow. That's that's where I was going. Ah, see, I, I, it took me a minute, but I got there. What if instead of when modern man first thought to write things down, instead of now the practice, the common practice then would have been in a, a hot and unmolded tablet of clay. That's where the, the earliest forms of writing began. Um, then shortly after that, you had chalk. You had like flint and chalk kind of writing with mm -hmm. stone um, uh, etched onto onto like uh, granite. Uh, what if modern man had decided to take his entire hand and dip it on the hot clay tablet and then form like a sort of picture with it? Like this, like this, like with a closed thumb, that means like sign house. language. You're, you're talking this, about sign language? No, 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 no. It's like a written, almost like a written sign language. Uh -huh. And then this, of course, means live long and prosper. But you have like the fist, like that. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different configurations you could do now that I'm thinking of it. I think that would that could change language as we know it. I think the the problem I have with that left hand, right hand. The problem I have with that is is your writing surface would have to be massive. Uh, assuming I don't think you could have enough yeah. hand combinations to to do words. I think you could letters. 
But to write it out, if this is A and this is B, I mean, you put these side by side to write a single word. Yeah, well, it would be it would be a pictographic system here is what I'm thinking of. Oh, hieroglyphics. Kind of like how it's what well, yeah, hieroglyphics, early early hieroglyphics that started as pictographic and then became ethnographic. But if you have like um, like how modern Chinese is, where like each character represents an idea or a word, and then you can combine that character with another character and it forms a completely different word. And then three, and that's another completely different word or idea. And these symbols would kind of do that. But yeah, yeah, I think you're right. You would need a, a giant surface. You would need like basically a floor size surface. But I think that that's totally plausible because the sure. only people that wrote things down were the important scribes who were writing things down for the king or the, the, or the, the warlord or whoever was in charge at the time. That was where the early, earliest writing came from, kind of legal, legal people. But what I'm kind of afraid of in this world we've created um, is that at some point about 100 years, 500 years after the, you know, the, the hand symbols were invented, um, <laughs> someone will say, gosh, if only we could make them smaller. I know, we'll invent a cylindrical ink dispensing device to draw smaller versions of the hands. Boiled. Um, well, we can... see, I thought the... the um... I thought the that when we when we agreed to uninvent something, that means that this this particular thing would just never get. But then, so then, invented. so so then, modernize that idea then. So people start out writing, pressing their hands in different ways into the into the clay. Yeah. Eventually, that expands to they can press their feet into the clay and make even more. Sure. Uh, images and symbols and combine these uh eventually you have um okay okay eventually you have these uh court almost like these courtyards where people make these giant massive symbols and there's really no writing in this world. You can't really you can't really write to each other in any way. I mean, <laughs> this is just like okay. This is really just kind of reserved for like communicating things that absolutely must be communicated with. Like, do not walk here or do not come here. Like, I don't know. All right. So then, I think eventually people would start like realizing that they could dip their hands in ink and put the ink on a paper and then maybe they maybe they make a shorthand almost and then they invent some kind of alphabet where they have their fingers dipped in this ink and it has like the tips of the fingers instead of like the whole hand and the tips of the fingers kind of make out an outline of those like how this used to mean a instead it's just like a finger that goes from dot one dot two that represents the entire hand. Like a a shorthand for the hand? Two. Okay. Yeah, a sh- exactly. A shorthand, but then it becomes ethnographic instead of pictographic. And then, then it's kind of like a modern alphabet, but it's all made of like fingerprints, basically. That's how I would modernize it. Okay. Then there'd just be a whole bunch of fingerprints everywhere. <laughs> no, that makes People sense. You would have really easy time getting your DNA. It's very personal. Stamps. That's another thing. I think people would invent stamps eventually, like, um, in, like, early modern era. They would have stamps that would have the fingerprints already made so people wouldn't have to get their hands all dirty. And they can, they could, then that would lead to movable type because they would have a, um, a machine that would basically put all these stamps down for you whenever you hit buttons. You would have a, then it would be a typewriter. And then you'd have eventually computers that would, that would, instead of characters we have today, have these fingerprints. These fingerprint symbols. You know, love it. And you would never need to use, this all came from us never having to use a pen or pencil. See, I would have, I would have gone with, I think, the problem is, if you remove the cylindrical writing device, let's assume for a second you remove ink. Because there wouldn't be a need to really invent 
slash develop ink if you didn't have a way to dispense it, right? Mm -hmm. So without ink, there really isn't any way to visually write some kind of language. Yes. You decided to use pictures created with the body, essentially, or at least how it Pretty began. What if, instead of a visual medium, we go with a tactile medium? I'm talking Braille. Okay. Of course, that's the modern version. I think the ancient version you could easily do with, you know, in, in a clay environment, deep, you know, depressions um, mm -hmm. in, in, in set patterns that denote, again, kind of like any kind of visual language like uh, Chinese or anything like that where you're using symbols. Um, do depressions in clay when it comes to, to parchment. You can either press it over a form, like a printing press, or um, do small holes. I mean, there's a number of ways you can get that visual feeling, but if you create similar patterns over and over, I think I think that could definitely be... And I realize I didn't invent Braille, but um, I think that would be a way that would, that would make sense if you're not going to come up with a way to draw something to, to connect the dots, then you actually create the dots themselves. Um, and I think that would be a very interesting world if you had to... You know, you couldn't read a billboard, for example. Well, maybe you could. I mean, I guess if the patterns were visually recognizable. Um, I guess it's not really that much different from what you described. The later version of what you described. Which is using fingers to create set fingerprint patterns. Um, I kind of just like the, the, the idea of it being more uh, tactile. Now, how about this one? How about it? What if instead of using ink, the people in this really early time used something else that was available to them? Something else that was fairly new and, um, and right there for them to, to have access to. What if they used fire to write their characters? What? If they used fire to write their characters, what if they burned characters into the stone and kind of basically used the fire as like a pen or a pencil? As like a brush, basically. They made like brush strokes with fire. So they take a, a really a really sharp no, that doesn't even have to be sharp. They take a, a rock, basically your average rock, and they, they put it in the fire for a long time. And then it gets really hot. They take it out of the fire, and being careful not to burn. Or they, the only people that could write would have heavy calluses on their hands so they'd be able to lift the rock right out of the fire and not be burned by it. Now, this rock would then produce a residue, and that residue would be the... The way that they would write. Things. I don't know why you it couldn't would, just, just. It would be like kind of like an etching. You just lick your finger and you put in the ash and you just draw with the ash. I don't. I feel like that's that's overthinking it maybe it's, a little. That bit. would be cheating because you can't use anything that's cylindrical. <laughs> uh, also, also the advantage of these rocks, aside from, uh, not having to get your fingers dirty, the advantage of these rocks. Is that you would actually you would just etch out an entire like thing, and then what if you wrote what if you wrote on the ashes that were on the um, that were on the rock? Like you took the hot rock, you wiped it on a bigger rock, and then you had like basically your pad of paper, and then you could write stuff in the ash, and then you wouldn't need a pen or a pencil. I yes, yes, yes. I think we've solved this one. All right. I think our future looks looks know, bright is the right word. Insults. Yes. <laughs> um all right. So I've got one. Something I know I, you have one. I I, I'm, I'm actually it. really excited all to hear right. this one. I rambled on for too long about the pencils and the lack thereof. I, I really want to hear what you have to say about your uninvention. And, 
And even better, I'm going to give you my stream of consciousness of how I got to this. Awesome. So I was Let's sitting move. yesterday thinking, what is something I wish was uninvented? Something I don't like. And I was thinking, and then I realized, you know, I own a couple different kinds of jeans. Blue jeans. I've got, like, really, really old work jeans that I mow the lawn in and stuff. I own, like, medium nice jeans that I could wear to casual functions, but, like, not to work. And then I own, like, dr fancy, I call them fancy jeans, um, and I wear those to special occasions. The problem with fancy jeans is they're a little more styled. And while they're not quite skinny jeans, they're a little tight. You know, they're, they're, t they're a tighter fit, a slim fit. And I don't find them as comfortable as regular jeans. And I think that's a common occurrence many people experience. And that le led me to thinking, what if we lived in a world where clothes and clothes type accessories were seen only were seen in the same way you would see a hammer purely as a utility device with no interest in style or culture around them again one of life's tough problems we're solving so here you're uninventing fashion, fashion. I, I i am a sense of fashion i am un i am uninventing clothing design so you're kind of uninventing a cultural norm or, yes. a, or like a like a social construct. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Now, I wouldn't Instead go of to, like literal thing. Now, like a little tool. I had to balance the idea of do you, do I go so far as to say I'm uninventing clothes? But I think that's too far. So I'm going to say clothes are are in the same way even even under the same purpose. way everyone would buy white socks, you know. I mean, although I guess even socks can be seen as a fashion item. I'm just trying to think of something that you just buy the same of everything. You, you just buy it because you buy it, and, and there's no variety to it. It just is what it is. Okay. And it's Interesting. Kind of like that. How would that change society? So, I think things really started to become sort of fashionable around this or in 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 like feudal times the people who cared about the only and the really the only people that were able to dress and have like a sense of fashion would be um like lords of the manor they would be able to be fashionable um and they would only really express this fashion when they were when they were meeting with other lords and having meetings um, with them. And then eventually, those that that kind of became excised into like important people have mm -hmm. to dress really nicely, but the ninety nine percent of peons don't really need to. Um, they didn't. The ninety nine percent of peons didn't really dress need nicely or or fashionably until probably like. A lot later than you might think, like probably like the turn of the sixteenth, seventeenth century. Like that's when fashion kind of came into play. So the the world without a fashion sense, I'm thinking, would be a world where we would be able, we would have to express our importance or our relevance in some other way, other than what we wear on the outside which is kind of awesome because in that way we have to like find a new outlet for making ourselves unique because it's kind of like a human it's become like a human drive to like be able to set ourselves apart that sounds kind of like a car commercial but <laughs> uh, the human instincts volkswagen no i you know that's a really you know i didn't because my first thought was oh if we didn't have Clothes, it would just be another way to bring us together as people because we wouldn't be separated by what we wear. Oh, I, think I think there's always right. this drive to that we, we kind of want to set ourselves apart in some way or distinguish ourselves. And Even in communist societies where everybody is supposed to be the same, people find ways of, you know, well, I have this state-issued TV, but my state-issued TV is a better picture than your state-issued TV. Like... Or they try to distinguish themselves with the work they do. Like, I do a better job picking the potatoes.
tomatoes than you do or something. We always, we always have this way of trying to set ourselves apart, no matter what, I think. Um, so what would that be if we can't express it through fashion? Well, let me pitch something up. So I think the reason, because it's true, there, even today, there are a lot of ways people express themselves in a way that they can compare themselves to others. It could be your, I won't say some because you might think think them as as the way you might the one you might select. But there are many ways we do it today. But I think the reason clothing is a good example is because it is uniquely personal, and it is something very close to you as a person. It it, it I mean clothing covers eighty percent of your body. You know, I, you look at a person, you will see the fashion. Period. There is no way to avoid it. You can't hide it. You can't. It is there. So, if clothing were not the option, I'm going to go with body modification. I'm going to go with tattoos and piercings and things that our society hasn't even invented yet because we haven't had a need to because we have fashion. So, who knows where you go with that? Um, but I right. think... Hair dyeing and lipstick oh, and makeup cosmetics. And, and, okay. and then you get into the crazy future shit where people you know, growing tails or who knows what, but I mean, yeah. the, 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 the science fiction stuff, but I think that is, is probably the most personal way you could probably approach that without doing fashion. I don't know. Do you have a thought? Yeah, no, I, I think you're, I think you're on the right track. I think that modification and sort of like adding, you know, more cosmetic stuff. That's really the only the only way that I, I think also to, to just to just piggyback on that maybe displaying of um, like jewelry and stuff like acquiring things that you can wear as accessories it would be that's the word is accessories like mm -hmm. the rise of accessories sure also there be there have to be another way that you could um, reflect your social standing and your and your it's a, it's cultural too because you have to. You kind of identify with the clothes that your culture wears, so that would, would be different. I think, like the world worldwide, different parts of the world would be wearing different things, and that'd be cool. But none of it would be like clothing; right. it would be all reflected in these body modifications that you said. I yeah. also would like to say I think we've just set up a really great dystopian future. Yes, yes, like yes. a movie. <laughs> Where, you know, like 1984 this, and roll. Spoiler alert, this is actually our story drafting episode. <laughs> we came up with a world where people don't drive cars with steering wheels. You know, they burn hands in order to write things. And they wear a lot of tattoos and maybe animal tails and ears and stuff. Matt, I, honestly, I think we may have invented a brand new writing prompt exercise. Because wow. this is like a great, Somehow. like I would imagine a creative writing class to come in one day and your prompt of the day is uninvent something. What would the world look like? Wow. We should, we should teach a class, man. Totally. <laughs> totally. I think this is a good idea. Get some college credit for uh, the, the folks job. at home. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's interesting. Now I will say we got a little more time left. I did have one thing I wish was invented. Yes. I want to hear that as well. And again, this came out of a practical real world need. I want the Nikola Tesla future of everything charges wirelessly. Why don't we? Come on. It is 2016. My phone dies and I have to plug it in. That is bullshit. That's pretty whack. I got to say. And, and Nikola Tesla, of course, tried, proposed a, a device, of course, never actually built it, um, that was supposed to broadcast wireless power. Across the entire world. Imagine you don't have to plug anything in. Everything just turns on and is always powered forever. That's pretty awesome. It also sounds like... Like, not to be the uh, the Debbie Downer here, but it sounds like cancer for everyone. <laughs> like lots Fair. of cancer. See, what I was going to say is it's going to end up being like your phone data plan where, okay, you have 800 megawatts a month. And if you go over, we're going to charge you some fees. And, yeah, you know, it would start there's... out like that, I think. With but then the... it would it would start out like that because I think that's like how texting started out where they charged you per character. Mm -hmm. And then if, 
for it. Like, and, and then minutes, but then those weren't a thing anymore. It's kind of like that. I think that it would start out like that, but I think eventually they would be like, like one company would come out and be like, here's the wireless forever plan. You pay us like $2 million and you never get charged. Oh my God. Anywhere. But could you imagine then you have coverage, right? So you could go into another state and your devices might not work. Because your electricity provider doesn't have towers in that oh, area. Wow. Yeah, it would it would basically be like let's start that entire thing over again with the with the yeah. <laughs> with the not access and the blackout okay. and the dead zones. See what we should do, right? And this is see this is interesting. So the new apartment complex I'm moving into has um has this thing where you um the way you pay for water is they take the entire complex's water use and based on the square footage of your apartment and how many people live there, average it out so we all divide it. And the less water we use collectively lowers our water cost. So if my neighbor decides to use twice as much water, I'm going to end up paying for it. Imagine if, again, sounding dystopian, the government owned all of the <laughs> electricity and you paid for it with your taxes, but they divided it based on an algorithm because it's wow. you know you pay your taxes. How many people live in your home, and and then you paid your share, and and the less electricity people used, the cheaper it would be for everyone. That idea smacks of socialism, <laughs> there, comrade. <laughs> Why don't you take that idea to the Kremlin? Oh, man. Yeah, that might be a one too far. <laughs> hey, there's got to be environmentalists out there who's like, that's a really good idea. Um, gosh. Yeah, that would be cool. But I honestly, I just want Apple to get it in my iPhone. Even if it's a little pad, I got to put it on. Like, ugh, it's just annoying. Mm. I think if that ever happened, that scenario that you explained, I think that all the libertarians in this country would seriously rebel and form their own colony in Texas, probably. Good, Let's be fair. It would be Texas. And they won't have any of our wireless power. So <laughs> jokes on them. <laughs> Sucks to be those guys. Can you imagine? I think we just added to our to our dystopian novel. Wow. Libertarian Texas. It's its own country. It secedes this because of a... the sharing, the forced sharing of, <laughs> of wireless power. Oh, geez. Wireless power has ruined the needs for states' rights. <laughs> I like it. Oh man, we are a couple of creative clowns. But Matt, we are out of time. We've done the full hour. Now time, that was something that I was expecting you to uninvent. <laughs> like uninvent the, the time. Concept of time. Like the human concept of time. Like like obviously there's sunrise and sunset and then everything in the middle, but I was like the idea of tracking time and keeping time and being places at a certain time. I don't time. think you could uninvent that. That's like think, uninventing oxygen. I just don't think oh, you could. Well, that's that's a that's a more recent invention than you might think. People really only used to keep no, track but, of sun up, sun down, and nighttime. But that's what I'm saying. I don't think you can avoid time. That's what I'm saying. You can't not track time because it is all around you happening. There's so many signs of time. I don't think simply not having clocks is enough, or not having a calendar is enough. Yeah, that's true. You could you could ignore the principle of time any more than you can ignore the sun itself. I w I was kind of hoping we would uninvent like Bruce Willis. Like, what would a world be like without maybe maybe we need someone more important? But then who would say Yippee Kaye, motherfucker? But that's what I'm saying. So who, what, what superstar would we? Michael Sarah? No, he, he's too young. No, who would? You know, there would be some unknown person who would be the new Bruce Willis. What would happen to current Bruce Willis? I don't know, Matt. We can't talk about it this week. But that's something you can ponder on tonight as you fall asleep in bed. What would a hmm. Bruce Willisless world look like? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Any any thoughts on what you want to do next week? Uh, I think that's for the folks at home to know and for us to find out. Fair enough. Let's... You'll have to subscribe and tune in next time to hear what we talk about because we don't even know. So go to upfordebate.tv. That is, of course, our website. If you go there, it's cool. It's purple. Um, and if you click, you can get all of our past episodes, audio and video. 
And if you click the subscribe link, it takes you to a cool page that has everywhere you can subscribe to the show on YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, iTunes, Google Play Music, RSS, most major podcast apps, or where you can follow us, like on Twitter at upfordebate.tv. You can email us, upfordebatetv at gmail.com. Um, as well uh we do the show weekly ish we will definitely be here next week uh so you should join us then on behalf of matt i'm sean uh, in case you weren't paying attention at the start we appreciate you joining us and hope we'll see you next time for an even better debate on up for debate